Thank you for joining me on this uh, talk on remote consulting, uh, governance and medical legal considerations. I'm Dr. Robert Lamb, I'm a GP over at the Grange Practice, but also on the Greater Manchester uh, GP Fellowship Programme. As part of that, I'm working with the Wigan Borough Clinical Commissioning Group. So the scope of this presentation, hopefully this is the first of a, of a run of presentations that we're going to give. We've realised that although we're, we're quite late into the uh, coronavirus pandemic and, and these new ways of working, there's still a demand and a need uh, for additional support for us as working clinicians to try and digest all the um, various bits of information out there for us. And hopefully I'm going to do that partly for you today. This presentation is going to cover some of the professional and medical legal guidance that's out there that applies to our current way of working that we may or may not be too familiar with. Further talks in future are planned, which you'll hear about in the coming weeks, but we'd really like to kind of get your feedback and suggestions as to further content, particularly initially around new ways of working, uh, but going forwards, other, other subjects you'd like us to cover as well. So the overview of this, this talk then, um, first off, what's the impetus for us to change? Why change? I'll cover performing and documenting a remote consultation, coronavirus pandemic considerations specifically, when not to do a remote consultation, IT methods of remote communication, some of the uh, solutions that we've been offered, receiving and storing patient images and files, and also some links to further reading and, and the things that I've referred to in this talk. So initially, why change seems a silly question. We all know that we're in the, the coronavirus pandemic at the moment, and it's really forced some, what were aspirational offers to patients in regards to remote consulting. We've had to really bring these in at a rapid pace, many of which we wouldn't be ready for in normal circumstances. We already have changed, is it to point out the obvious, and, and this is not me saying that this is we should change to this model, but it's we've done so out of necessity. What hopefully I'll add in with this, this talk is that help you to adapt safely um, to these, these new changes that have been imposed upon us and also how to kind of make sure your, your practice and documentation stands up to would stand up to scrutiny. You may or may not have come across this, this term called total triage. On the 27th of March, um, NHS England suggested that GPs or, or insisted that GPs should adopt this full triage first model, which is also referred to as total triage, where essentially all patients have to be remotely triaged before offering any face-to-face -face consultation. So every patient will receive a, a remote consultation in some way, whether, even if they need to be seen. It's very stressful. It, imposing these new ways of working and, and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there, there may be benefits or, or there should be benefits to patients and supposedly to healthcare um, services as well. Patients will have increased convenience, they'll have reduced cost of travelling to appointments um, and there are some who believe it will save uh, healthcare money as well. Different ways of working, I've said, equals new ways of documenting. It does really extend the kind of the amount that we have to write and document by by working remotely and also the um, changes to our normal practice so, it, so our consultations inevitably are going to be longer in, in um, the amount that we're, we're documenting so hopefully we'll, we'll go through some of the the needs that the, are set out by the GMC the RCGP the RCN MPS and MDU so lots of bodies that are, are giving their guidance and um, advice out we should be consulting and documenting things. I've, I've tried to summarise as best I can in this talk. So I'll start with this infographic that was produced by the Royal College, uh, sorry, the General Medical Council, um, and it refers to how to go about performing a remote consultation. I should say that this was produced before the coronavirus pandemic, so there are slight adaptations to our current way of working, and this was more of a general approach to when it's appropriate to consider. So on the left side, you'll notice that there's this remote consultations may be appropriate when, and they, I'll talk through, they suggest when the, when the treatment and uh, clinical need is straightforward, when you have access, full access, sorry, to the patient's medical record. If all the information they want and need about treatments options, for, exa for example, you can convey over this um, remote way of, of consulting with them. You don't need to examine the patient. You have a safe system in place to prescribe and the patient has capacity. So those are the sorts of situations where you may wish to look at a remote consultation. Obviously the current situation we are, all consultations are remote to start with, so that doesn't quite fit to the, the current model, but is a good reference guide. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in, in, in due time. On the right side of the infographic says face-to-face -face consultations may be preferable when 
um, the, the critical need is complex, that you don't have uh, access to the full uh, record of the, of the patient, and that might be in kind of out of hour settings, for example. Um, you do not have access to um, Sorry, I apologise for that. Um, you're not the patient's usual GP, so you don't know the patient well. Um, you need to examine the patient. It's hard for you to ensure that you get across all the information and, and what you need to convey through that remote consulting model. Uh, and you're unsure of the patient capacity. So if there's any doubts about capacity, remotely consulting is not the, the way to go ahead. There is a part at the bottom which suggests that injectable cosmetic products shouldn't be prescribed remotely as well. As I say, this was produced before COVID-19. So there's one part of the, the guidance that comes through with it, this doesn't really reflect is if you do get a call from a patient who is abroad, um, your patient abroad for some reason, such as being quarantined in a, a different country, the default response should be that if there's, a, if there's an acute issue, then they should be seeking their own um, local medical advice um, where they are. If you feel that it's related to a, a query related to a chronic condition that you can safely manage remotely um, and again you have all those parts in place where you it would be appropriate to do a remote consultation you could consider doing it um, but be cautious going ahead with that so this slide about performing and documenting a remote consultation a lot of these things really are, are going over the fundamentals many of which you will be aware of but there are particular pitfalls that you can um, come up against with with working remotely and not having the patient in front of you so starting with the obvious of it, confirming patient identity um, and again if you, if you can't be confident of any of these points you really should be questioning is rem remote assessment appropriate at every step really if the patient's known to you, you've got full medical re access to their, their full medical record sorry um, and you can confirm their identification then then go ahead and again the the defense unions are suggesting you should be documenting that confirm that they can hear so again overcoming any practical considerations um, again the, the defense union suggests that we should be co confirming in the notes that there was no technical issues with the, the consultation and um, if there are problems with that again consider is this the right method of consulting is it the right time to perform that consultation if they're not in an appropriate environment for example could you could you defer it for another time um, and is there a more appropriate way of consulting with that patient for that particular problem where are they it's not something we would naturally think to check because usually the patient is in front of us um, i did attend the mps webinar which there was a, a gp who suggested that they'd uh, performed a, a full remote consultation with patient consent but only at the end of the consultation did they realize that they were a working taxi driver with a fare in the back of the car um, so even though the patient may deem it's appropriate to go ahead you as a professional may not so it's, it's worth clarifying that who is with them it you may not think to ask this initially, but it's important to consider who can overhear the conversation. Uh, does the patient consent to this? And again, does this raise any safeguarding concerns that you, you feel that remote consulting is not appropriately? Consent is, is mentioned again and again in, in just about every piece of the, the guidance that comes through. The RCGP and NHS advise that their consent is implicit by partaking in a remote consultation, uh, but should be checked and documented. Um, does the patient feel that this method of consulting is appropriate for them? Um, and if you vary from what their preference of, of consultation method is, you should document why and justify that. Um, so which method of consultation? I'm not going to go into great detail about the different methods of, of remote consultation, but I'll, I'll briefly run over. Um, you, you do need to consider before you, you engage in, in any method what's what is needed from the assessment is there an examination necessary and what is possible by that means that you, you choose to go down online consultation is a is a term used which which mostly refers to text-based interactions such as um, email or digital tools such as accurix or ask my gp emis um, these sorts of things there's obviously telephone consultation, which I, I imagine most of us are familiar with, um, and more so we're, we're looking to use video consultations. Um, it should be through an approved NHS app, such as Accurix, That's My GP, EMIS, these sorts of things. Um, but NHSX do suggest that during the pandemic, um, if you don't have that as an option, but you do have another platform that you can use, and, and both of you are in agreement, you can use other platforms, such as um, FaceTime or um, 
WhatsApp message, these, these sorts of things, you, you can use those things to do a video consultation. Um, really, I don't think there's many of us that would find ourselves in that position where there's not an NHS approved um, platform to do it on. Um, what's the patient preference? You should consider this, but also you use your clinical judgment as to whether you can you can safely kind of assess the problem that they're asking for help with on that, that method of communication. Again, if you deviate from that, justify and document why you've done that. Um, it says at the bottom, children can be can be assessed by telemedicine if you and the, the parent is, is happy with that. And that was advised by the Medical Defence Union. Um, as with any sort of consultation as well, it's important to suggest that robust follow up and safety netting is, is really important, obviously. So we've, we've talked about adapting to these new methods of working, but on top of all that, we've also got a, a pandemic to, to deal with as well. So it does add further restrictions to practice, not just opening up other options for consulting. Um, so if we, it, it does really force us into a position where we're gonna deviate from our normal practice. Uh, and that can feel really uncomfortable. If, if we're doing so, we should discuss with the patient why we're deviating from normal practice and document that. Um, one thing that, that we're looking at is, is ways to kind of support practices across the borough with, with addressing this, but um, in our own practice we've, we've come up with a couple of templates that can quickly document almost as a, as a standard entry into the notes with every consultation. Um, it is suggested that you should document in the consultation that we are during the, the coronavirus pandemic. So it, it kind of clearly demarcates that this is a consultation that's happened during this time. Uh, just for any reason, you need to come back to that documentation. It, it clearly um, justifies why you may have deviated it again if in that instance. Um, we've got a pretext in our practice that suggests patient consulted remotely due to extraordinary circumstances caused by the coronavirus pandemic in order to reduce risk of transmission. And we, we put that on every consultation um, just to again highlight that this was a, a consultation during the, the coronavirus pandemic. We also, um, in agreeing a plan with a patient, we have a, a kind of a default template that we can look to that suggests, advise that in normal circumstances, this problem would warrant further investigation or examination, but in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and risks involved, we agree to forego this. And again, if you're deviating from your normal practice, it, it documents that agreement with the patient and also um, why you've done it. Coming back to that discomfort of, of practicing outside what is normal for us, they, they do advise from the defence unions, they suggest that you should discuss any any um, deviation from your normal practice with a colleague and document it. And that will just make any comeback on any decisions you make all the more robust that if, if a colleague would agree with your management, again, you'll be less likely to be criticised for that. When not to use a remote consultation crudely comes back to the initial GMC infographic. Um, so you should consider face-to-face -face consultation over remote, remote consulting if there's a safeguarding concern. If examination is needed is what the GMC referred to, but in the current situation, it's more is the examination needed and cannot be deferred. Um, so some circumstances you might feel an examination is needed, but if if that can be deferred for another another time, um, you may you may not necessarily need to. to convert to a face-to-face -face consultation. If, obviously, if there's technical limitations of um, not being able to perform the, the consultation adequately, if there's a potential breach of confidentiality, again, that's going to come back to who is with the patient, what's their environment, this sort of thing. Um, barriers to effective use, so patient factors such as hearing impairment. And again, if there's any questions of capacity, this, this isn't for a remote consultation, really. And really underpinning all those things, if you or the patient deem the consultation as inappropriate um, to do remotely, then it's not appropriate. So moving on to face-to-face -to -face consultations, how should we be approaching those currently? Um, if you do deem that face-to-face -face consultation is needed, we should also question, are you the most appropriate person to do that face-to-face -face consultation with their part with their problem warrant someone else seeing them anyway or, or someone more qualified to do that that assessment um, really to 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 reduce the number of um, face to face interactions we have again to reduce risk of transmission and, and specific risk to, to staff and patients document why you brought in so you are really kind of taking a risk in, in providing a face to face document uh, face to face assessment so really consider whether you should document why you've decided to kind of go against that What's the safest for the patient? Again, 
on balance of, of risk with the, the pandemic and also with the, the problem they, they're describing, what's the, what's the balance of risk and, and consider that. The final point hasn't really been highlighted by any of the, the um, references I refer to. However, I do wonder whether it's worth documenting the PPE that you've used for the, for the patient and staff. Just should anyone test positive for coronavirus, then it may have implications on um, what action is needed in the practice and for the patient as well. If we've documented that, it's clear. So moving on to some of these IT solutions, this may be a subject for further talks and, and it's probably likely in reality, um, but I'll, I'll touch upon some of the things that have, have come about in, in response to the pandemic and, and are at our disposal to use. So there's triage support programmes, primarily in Wigan, I believe it's, it's exclusively Ask My GP or the EMIS solution. Um, they do have their, um, their potential benefits as well as the difficulties that come with, with using them. Um, particularly, it, it does give us an opportunity potentially to give template responses, so it, it may direct people to more um, NHS guidance to seek the advice from the pharmacist first if that's more appropriate for um, common complaints that should really be addressed by um, other professionals before seeking consultation with a GP. So it is an opportunity to re-educate patients as well as um, giving them more accessibility to us as well. It does give opportunity to do some pre-consultation workups such as scored assessments um, and documenting and, and excluding red flag symptoms. It, they can offer a kind of video consultation platform, particularly I, I personally I know that Ask My GP is, is useful um, and a, a personal view on, on Ask, Ask My GP is it does give us an opportunity to, to revert to the patient waiting for us model, whereas we are chasing patients a lot to, to do our consultations at the moment. But if you queue up a, a video consultation, um, it shows that the patient is waiting rather than you chasing them. Um, so that's a useful thing to, to look at. Accurix is, is available across the board and free on their basic package, I believe. Um, it's a useful package that, that allows you to do video, video consultations for, for those of us who don't have webcams. You can um, set that up with your own mobile phone as long as it's connected to the internet and it doesn't show your personal contact details with the patient. Um, so that's a useful tool to look at. You can use it to reduce admin burden, such as texting patients directly rather than um, tasking admin to, to contact patients for medical reviews, that sort of thing. Um, it's an alternative way to receive images and it does also allow you to save directly to the clinical record, which is a useful feature. Um, there's also the, the opportunity to send and receive files on there as well. Um, so if no open request on your, your kind of triage platform, you can send Med3s, blood forms uh, and also receive uh, photos, as I've said on there. I'll, I'll briefly touch on NHS email. Um, Main point on this I want to go over is, is encryption, um, but any sort of any NHS to NHS email uh, is, is encrypted and, and safe to use for, with patient identifying information. Even if emailing a, an official uh, body outside of an NHS.net email address, NHS Digital suggests that we should be encrypting everything that has any sort of patient identifying information on, um, which is everything we email essentially so so it's worth knowing how to secure a message with encryption and it's really easy to do once you know how to do it so you would compose your email and add any attachments as, as you normally would do but to, to encrypt the message to start your subject heading you put so in the subject line close at uh, square brackets secure and close the square brackets there um, it's so it's, it's square brackets rather than round brackets and that's important so that will send an encrypted message rather than a, a, a normal email message and they will receive a, a notification on their end that they've been sent an encrypted message uh, and they can log on to a, a service called egress and download any any attachments or message on there um, and just to point out that nhs teams is the nhs's preferred platform for kind of professional communication within teams rather than things like whatsapp and, and those other platforms um, I'll briefly touch on receiving and storing image files because um, this, is, this is relevant and, and something we're doing more readily now. So it's important to, to suggest that guidance that relates to this is uh, GMCs making and using video and audio recordings of patients guidance. Um, but this is actually applying to, to images equally. So consent, again, is, is really hit hard in all the guidance on, on this, um, this subject. So consent needs to be specific to the storage and use of the image. So you need to have explicit consent from the patient to store the image 
for the purpose you're store, storing it for. So for example, uh, is it just for their own medical care or is it going to be used for education purposes? Um, how long and where it will be stored? So really that will be on their secure medical record. How long, really indefinitely until they tell us otherwise, and also who will have access to it. So we, you would suggest relevant um, health professionals helping them with that particular problem. Capacity is a real uh, key issue on this, particularly in children or those people with cognitive impairment. Those who cannot consent, we do need to seek consent from those who have authority to consent on their behalf. And it must be in the patient's best interest uh, to proceed with, with receiving and storing that image. Um, if we're receiving images or, or files by email, it must be by our NHS.net account. We shouldn't be using any other ones. Um, if you don't have consent for it, then again, don't proceed. And if there's any doubt about anything, um, is, is remote consultation appropriate? It really should be the question you ask throughout every step. Intimate images um, is a particular a particular subject um, that is covered by particularly the, the MDU guidance, which I've linked to at the end. Um, really have to question is remote consultation appropriate for an intimate problem are you likely to do a, an examination anyway because obviously you're not going to be able to palpate and do other, other tests and things um, so should you really receive an image of something you're going to go on to examine anyway in, in person um, further consideration is taking and sending uh, intimate images from children under the 18, age of 18 may potentially lead to criminal investigation is the wording of the MDU um, to really consider should you actually be dealing with these sorts of problems remotely in, in, a, in a minor. Um, again, touching on chaperones, the, the guidance is really we should be using chaperones as we would be doing as a, as a face to face. Um, should be introduced and documented as usual, and that's the RCGP guidance. Um, and again, as usual, family members are not adequate as a chaperone. I've put some links on here at the end to some of the, the guidance that I've referred to. I'm conscious of the, the um, the Royal College of Nursing guidance isn't linked to there, but it is on the quick reference guide, which we've, we've emailed out. Um, so I hope that's been useful. I've put on the end there um, just some appraisal points. So it's it's really useful that we, we get to do these um, these webinars, but it's, it's important that we we get credit for doing it, too. So I've put on there um, a description, which I would I would describe what we've, we've gone over today and also some points you may want to reflect on within your, your appraisal as well. So um, hopefully a quick entry that you can get over and done with quickly there. Um, any questions at all? I'm happy to field them specifically around this topic. Um, and my email address is robert.lam1 at nhs.net. Um, any further suggestions of, of content that you want help with, um, particularly initially around remote consulting, but if there's further demand for education, we'd want to know about that also. Um, we'd like you to spread the word also, because this, this really applies to any clinician, be that healthcare assistants, pharmacists, physios, anyone that's performing a remote consultation, spread the word about this and, and let them know, because hopefully everyone can uh, benefit from it. Okay, I wish you well.